In this session, we will look at the poem, A Prayer for My Daughter by William Butler Yeats, prescribed for the students of BA Part 3, English Literature, Paper 1. The Introduction to the Poem A Prayer for My Daughter by W.B. Yeats demonstrates the poet's concern and anxiety over the future well-being and prospects of his daughter, Anne. He has written the poem in 1919, shortly after her birth and World War I. So the ongoing unsettling feel is visible in the background and the poet's mind. The poem appeared for the first time in his poetry collection, Michael Roberts and the Dancer, in 1921. The Summary of the Poem A Prayer for My Daughter by William Butler Yeats opens with an image of the newborn child sleeping in a cradle. A storm is raging with great fury outside his residence. A great gloom is on Yeats's mind and is consumed with anxiety as to how to protect his child from the tide of hard times ahead. The poet keeps walking and praying for the young child and as he does so, he is in a state of reverie, meaning he is remembering something. He feels a kind of gloom and worry about the future of his daughter. He says, as I walk and pray for my younger daughter, I imagine in a state of excitement and reverie that the future years, that is years of violence and bloodshed and frenzy, have already come and that they seem to come dancing to the accompaniment of a drum which is beating frantically. These future years are seen by Yeats' imagination as emerging out of the murderous, treacherous innocence of the sea. <coughs> in other words, the sea seems to be innocent, but is capable of giving birth to those howling storms which are capable of levelling everything, that is, destroying everything. <coughs> Yeats wants his daughter to possess some qualities so that she can face the future years independently and with confidence. Yet says, let her be given beauty, but a more important thing is that her beauty should not be of a kind which may either make her proud of her beauty or distract a stranger's mind and eyes. Those whose beauty is capable of making them proud consider beauty and end, an end in itself. The result is that pride leads to their losing natural kindness in some cases of that heart, revealing intimacy which helps them to make the right choice in life. Being able to make the right choices in life is a very important thing, but those who have excessive beauty are unable to do so and never find a good friend in the true sense of the world. The great thing about the poem is that it has a specific as well as general applicability. At the same time, the poem makes a, an indirect reference to Maud Gone also, whom Yeats loved so much and yet could not win her hand. The poet looks within himself and finds that there is hatred inside. He thinks that hatred kills innocence and wishes that his daughter should not harbour hatred. It was because of this unwholesome bent of the mind that Maud Gone married a fool. The poet wished that her daughter should not cultivate a frantic intellect. He thinks that her daughter can remain innocent if she is free from hatred and intellectual fanaticism. The innocence is self-delighting, self-appeasing and self-affrighting. 
The poet's last wish is that his daughter should marry a person of aristocratic family who may take her to a home where tradition and ceremony fill the atmosphere. In the end, the poem is a prayer for order and grace in a battered civilization. Behind the prayer, of course, are Yeats's bitter memories of Maud Gone, who had come to stand for the tragedy of how beauty and grace can be distorted by politics, intellectual hatred, and arrogance. W. B. Yeats, in his tenth stanza poem, A Prayer for My Daughter, questions how best to raise his daughter. Though by 1919 the war was over, this is the First World War, in Ireland it yet turned normal. So he ponders how she will survive the difficult times ahead in the politically turbulent times. The poem not only expresses the helplessness of Yeats as a father, but all fathers who had to walk through this situation. He wants to give his daughter a life of beauty and innocence, safety and security. He further wants her to be well-mannered and full of humility, free from intellectual hatred and being strongly opinionated. Finally, he wants her to get married into a, an aristocratic family which is rooted in spirituality and traditional values. Analysis of a prayer, prayer for my daughter. <coughs> Stanza 1, which reads, Once more the storm is howling and half hid under this cradle hood and cover lid my child sleeps on. There is no obstacle but Gregory's wood and one bare hill whereby the haystack and roof leveling wind bred on the Atlantic can be stayed. And for an hour I have walked and prayed because of the great gloom that is in my mind. The poem, A Prayer for My Daughter, opens with the image of the child sleeping in a cradle, half hidden by its wood. Hood, sorry. The child sleeps innocently amidst the howling storm outside, but Yeats couldn't settle down due to the storm inside. The storm howling symbolizes destruction mentioned by the poet in his The Second Coming. The wind bred in Atlantic has no obstacles except the estate of Lady Gregory, referring to the poet's patroness and a bare hill. The direct impact of the wind, meaning to the force of the outside world, especially on his daughter, worries the poet. Because of this great gloom, he walked and prayed for his daughter to be protected from the physical storm outside and the political storm brewing across Ireland. Stanza 2 I have walked and prayed for this young child an hour and heard the wind stream upon the tar and under the arches of the bridge and scream in the elms above the flooded stream, imagining an excited reverie that the future years had come, dancing to a frenzied drum out of the murderous innocence of the sea. In the second stanza of A Prayer for My Daughter, Yeats worries about the future are further explained. He hears the sea screaming upon the tar, under the bridge and elms, elms are type of trees, above the flooded stream. Onomotopoia word, scream and the flooded stream, symbolize <clears throat> the poet's overwhelming anxiety for his daughter. Onomotopoia basically means repetition of the same sound of the letter. Here the letter repeated is S. Also, it refers to the great flood in the Bible. Due to his haunting fear, he imagines the future coming out of sea and dances to the frenzied drum, referring to war and bloodshed. In the last line, the poet employs paradox, murderous innocence, to contrast the world and his daughter, which also recalls the images of blood 
dimmed died in the second coming. Stanza 3 May she be granted beauty and yet not beauty to make a stranger's eye distraught or hers before a looking glass for such being made a beautiful overmuch. Consider beauty a sufficient end, lose natural kindness and maybe the heart revealing intimacy that chooses right and never find a friend. In the third stanza of A Prayer for My Daughter, Yeats prays for his daughter to be gifted with beauty. At the same time, he does not want her beauty to distraught or make her dependent on her beauty for everything. Further, he does not want her to become proud or vain that she spends all day staring at the mirror and fails to have natural companionships. The poet implies too much beauty to be a dangerous one, that he wants her to be beautiful enough to secure her a husband. Stanza 4 Helen being chosen found life flat and dull and later had much trouble from a fool while that great queen that rose out of the spray being fatherless could have her way yet close a bandy-legged smith for man it's a certain that fine women eat a crazy salad with their meat whereby the horn of plenty is undone. In stanza 4 of A Prayer for My Daughter, Yeats substantiates his view on how excessive beauty has always been a source of trouble and destruction. He turns to Helen in Greek mythology, considered to be the most beautiful woman on earth, brought the doom upon her and many others. The image of Helen evokes another figure and that is of Aphrodite who rose out of the spray. The union of Aphrodite with Hephaestus, bandy-legged smith, brings to mind the Maud Gone and McBride episode. That is Maud Gone who married a foolish and ugly looking man called McBride. It makes the poet wonder if the beautiful women eat something stupid for salad that they make a stupid decision which brings misery forever. The rich horn of plenty is suggestive of courtesy, aristocracy and ceremony that is lost by those women who make stupid decisions. Stanza 5 In courtesy I would have her chiefly learned Hearts are not had as a gift but hearts are earned by those that are not entirely beautiful. Yet many that have played the fool, for beauty's very self has charm made wise, and many a poor man that has roved, loved and thought himself beloved, from a glad kindness cannot take his eyes. In stanza 5 of the poem, the poet continues with what he wants his daughter to possess, more than mere beauty. He wants his daughter to learn to be compassionate and kind. Many times, men who believed to love and loved by the beautiful women faced disappointment compared to those who found love in the modest yet compassionate, meaning caring women. Moreover, he says, modest and courteous people attract hearts than those with beauty, referring to his own marriage. Ultimately, he makes it clear that he wants his daughter to be an agreeable young woman than an arrogant beauty. Stanza 6 May she become a flourishing hidden tree that all her thoughts may li like the linnet be and have no business but dispensing round their magnanimities of sound. Nor but in merriment begin a chase, nor but in merriment a quarrel. O oh, may she live with some green, like some green laurel, rooted in one dear perpetual place. In stanza 6 of the poem, Yeats continues to talk about his hopes and expectations for his daughter. As she grew up, he wants her to be happy and content. He wants her to become a flourishing hidden tree and her thoughts like a linnet referring to its innocence and cheerfulness. 
like a linnet he wants her to be satisfied in herself and infect others with her happiness further he wants her to live like a laurel rooted in a particular place the poet reveals his wish on his daughter being rooted in the tradition stanza 7 my mind because of because the minds that i have loved the sort of beauty that i have approved prosper but little has dried up of late yet knows that to be choked with hate may well be of all evil chances chief if there is no hatred in a mind assault and battery of the wind can never tear the linnet from the leaf yet continues to talk about self contentment women in stanza 7 of a of the poem he believes that kind self contained traditionally rooted women are incorruptible the poet considers hatred to be the cause of all evil and prays that her to be left off that evil further he believes that a soul free from hatred will preserve its innocence and hatred just as the storm outside can't tear leaves from sturdy trees turmoil and war cannot break a strong woman stanza 8 and intellectual hatred is the worst so let her think opinions are accursed have i not seen the loveliest woman born out of the mouth of plenty's horn because of her opinionated mind barter that horn and every good by quiet natures understood for an old bellows full of angry wind in stanza 8 of the poem the poet implores his daughter to shun meaning reject and avoid passion and wild wild feelings that he considered as the weakness of beautiful women she must be temperate because people who love deeply could hate deeply too hate destroys people and makes them do cruel things especially intellectual hatred which is worst of all kinds the poet reflects upon his emotional state when maud gone rejected him to marry john macbride he wants his daughter to experience neither the dis- disappointment nor hatred stanza 9 considering that all hatred driven hence the soul recovers radical innocence and learns at last that it is self delighting self appeasing self affrighting and that its own sweet will is heaven's will she can do every face should scowl and every wind quarter howl or every bellows burst be happy still the ninth stanza continues to describe the impact of hatred and the benefit of staying away from hatred once hatred is driven out the soul could recover its innocence then the soul would be free to explore and find that it is self delighting self appeasing and self affrighting according to the poet the ideal woman makes everyone happy and comfortable despite all storms of misfortunes that come in her way she is a stronghold for people around her and her will would be that of heavens for she has a clear mind stanza 10 and may her bridegroom bring her to a house where all is accustomed ceremonious for arrogance and hatred are the wares peddled in the thoroughfares how but it in custom and in ceremony are innocence and beauty born ceremony is a name for the rich horn and custom for the spreading laurel tree in the last stanza of a prayer for my daughter the poet expresses his final wish he prays that his daughter to be married to a good husband who takes her to a home with aristocratic values and traditions there he believes that neither arrogance nor hatred of common folks could be found but morality and purity further 
the poet does not want her to live a decadent life he concludes by stating that his daughter could be rooted would be rooted in spiritual val values like a laurel tree form and structure of the poem the poem of prayer for my daughter written in the ly lyric form containing 10 8 line stanzas the stanza form is the same as employed by him in in memory of major robert gregory each stanza follows a regular rhyme scheme of a a b b c d d c the poem follows a metrical structure that alternates between iambic pentameter and tocriac trochaic pentameter the poem is structured as a poet's appeal to god and to his daughter on how he wants her to be like as she grows up theme and setting of a prayer for my daughter the poem a prayer for my daughter portrays the theme of love and anxiety of a father who has been blessed with a daughter it also presents the poet's hopes for his daughter and his expectation of her becoming a very beautiful woman blessed with the attributes of a virtuous soul the setting of the poem is uncertain for the poem is conceived in the mind of the poet the speaker is the poet himself talking to his daughter the poem is con conversational and didactic in tone meaning it is written with the purpose of teaching his daughter something with varying emotions of gloom uncertainty hope and fear what is the main theme of the poem a prayer for my daughter by wb yeats themes and meanings a prayer for my daughter is concerned with surviving the chaos in the modern world the separation of reason from passion or the surrender of reason to one's own violence or the anarchy of the external world the ascendancy of irrationality or animal instinct over reason and culture is vividly expressed in the widely quoted image of the second coming where turning and turning in the widening gyre the falcon cannot hear the falconer yeats thus far in his career had celebrated the mighty irish heroes of both legend and the historical past and present those courageous men and women who sacrificed themselves for their ideals now however the poet expresses a certain ambivalence towards those heroes he understands that in the necessary sacrifice for a cause one may surrender heart too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart he wrote in the poem easter 1916 in fact any single minded commitment to political social or intellectual causes even to beauty may become obsessive and negate destroy one's more Im important personal and humane concerns a prayer for my daughter proposes the means of rescuing the self heart and soul true beauty from a world of growing disorder and increasing human misery critical appreciation of the poem A prayer for my daughter exposes the typical modernist sentiment of the poet. The poet has portrayed a way of life and would like his daughter to adopt it. The kind of philosophy he formulates in the poem is oriented towards an emphasis on the importance of tradition, custom and culture in the modern world which is dominated by chaos. the tradition custom culture is certainly aristocratic he is of the opinion that aristocracy is the only culture which can redeem the modern world of chaos and anarchy for him aristocracy is the source of aesthetic intellectual and cultural beauty therefore probably because of nietzsche's influence upon him he expresses his hatred for commoners and wishes his daughter to be trained in the school of aristocracy he considers it an ideal way of life this is a leisurely well reasoned ideal 
based not only on mythology and history, but also on his own experience. The poet advocates an essentially non-Christian order, the keynote of which is a, is a man's sense of his own nobility and self-sufficiency. The poet has left sentiments and pathos behind and has cultivated an almost tragic outlook. He can now combine the appreciation of beauty with a sense of the tragic rather than a pathetic element of life. He can now impart meaning to the ordinary events of life which his earlier poetry did not attempt. In the process, his poetry becomes a vehicle of public speech. The poem is strikingly flexible. The poem can move through description of the place we are beginning to recognize as the tar. It can freely describe the poet's mood of gloom and then move to the idea of beauty in women from there to the symbols of great love found disappointing to Helen, Aphrodite and by implication to Maud gone. The poem is decorated with a number of phrases and images that are suggestive and evocative. Much is implied and more is meant than strikes the ear. <clears throat> the poem is a mixture of symbols. Its richness of texture is remarkable and is easy flow of ideas. The storm howling symbolizes destruction recalls the mere anarchy loosed upon the world of the poem, the second coming. The flooded streams also recall the havoc to be wrought in the second coming. The murderous innocence of the sea also recalls the images of blood-dimmed tide. The bandy-legged smith is Magbride and Helen is Mordgon by implication. Yeats has Maud gone in his mind when he says that it is certain that fine women eat a crazy salad. <clears throat> the rich horn of plenty is suggestive of curtsy, aristocracy and ceremony. The hidden laurel tree can provide through custom the innocence of soul. So the images follow one another in succession, that is one after the other. The image of Helen evokes another figure, that of Aphrodite, who rose out of the spray of the sea. The union of Aphrodite with Hephaestus, bandy-legged smith, brings to mind the Maud gone Magbride episode. Thus, the image cluster becomes increasingly complex. In this poem, the poet praises curtsy, charm, wisdom, and the glad kindness that Yeats had found in marriage. His main outburst is again hatred. It is against hatred, and especially the intellectual hatred. The idea is that a beautiful woman should despoil the subjectivity of her nature by the politics of objectivity, or sacrifice the unity of her being to a cause outside itself. Because of his showing of hatred in the poem, some critics have pointed out that the poem is snobbish. The poem has a ring of optimism about it in thinking that mere anarchy cannot harm the child if she is innocent and nicely bred. The poem also has been criticized as based on triviality, for the poet has not desired for his daughter a way of life consistent with the highest religious or moral ideals. He has not prayed for any Christian virtues for her. Reverent as he is, he does not convey any religion. Instead, we are offered in the poem an aristocratic faith. However, all such criticism is irrelevant. The poet desires for her organic innocence and freedom from hatred. The ideals which he uphold, upholds are not theoretical but practical and they can be easily adopted into practice and a state of grace attained. 
the poet has formulated an essentially non-Christian order, the keynote of which is man's sense of his own nobility and self-sufficiency. The poet has been true to his convictions and so the poem is another expression of his art, artistic honesty. On a prayer for my daughters, the coming of ruin upon civilization still occupy, preoccupies Yeats, imagining an inexcited reverie that the future years had come, dancing to a frenzied drum out of the murderous innocence of the sea. But the poem does move from the personal to the general and somehow philosophical issues. It moves through description of the place. We also recognize the symbolic ideals of a good culture, the tar, the laurel tree and custom and ceremony. The poem moves from the real concern of violence of the times. It describes the poet's mood of gloom. And then it moves to the ideal of beauty in women. And from there it moves to symbols of great love found disappointing, to Helen, Aphrodite, and by implication, to Maud Gone. There is a praise of courtesy, charm, wisdom, and the glad kindness that Yeats had found in marriage, as well as a hope for merriment, meaning enjoyment. Then comes the terrible denunciation of intellectual hatred and of Maud Gone, the loveliest woman born, whose opinionated mind is savagely attacked. The last stanzas praise innocence and custom and ceremony. It is both relevant and meaningful in the context of the terrible violence caused by intellectual hatred in early 20th century Europe though it might sound a little chauvinistic to modern readers. With this, we end the session on the poem, A Prayer for My Daughter by W.B. Yeats. Thank you.